would like to reconvene the meeting and call this meeting to order for the City Council meeting of June 2nd, 2020. Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Council Member Cordero? Here. Council Member Maltz? Here. Council Member Sato? Here. Council Member Waterfield? Here. And Madam Mayor Patino? Here. Um, City Attorney, Mr. Watson, could you please give us a closed session report? There was discussion uh, with the legal counsel. Uh, there is no reportable interest. Thank you. As there are no proclamations this evening, the first item on the agenda is the public comment period. Madam Clerk, would you please read the criteria for the public comment portion of the agenda? This time is reserved to accept comments from the public on consent agenda items, closed session items, or matters not otherwise scheduled on the printed agenda. Unless otherwise directed by the mayor, speakers will have three minutes to comment. Direction to staff may be given. However, state law does not allow action to be taken on matters not on the printed agenda. Once the public comment period commences, no other speakers will be allowed to submit a request to speak. Madam Clerk, do we have any written comments? We do. Um, we have, so Madam Mayor, staff received one written comment from Nancy Nolan Orchard asking that the council consider an ordinance banning all fireworks, and several emails, multiple emails today, asking that the pool remain open during the summer. Thank you. And we also have two requests to speak, sorry. And two requests to speak, okay. Uh, so we have Michael Ashmore first. Okay. Mr. Ashmore, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hello. Okay. A new world for all of us. Are you, are you ready for me to start? Yes, sir. Uh, well, thank you for letting me speak. Uh, I know these are difficult times and we probably aren't getting a lot of thank you. So I want to thank you for your leadership and commitment to our city. And I'd like to speak about any potential budget cuts and give some food for thought as it pertains to the pool. Pools in our country have already, and our county have already opened and begun providing services in Carpinteria and Santa Barbara. We're 100% invested in a safe return to activities and practices, many of which have already been happening in our county. The Santa Maria Swim Club is a nonprofit that's been delivering swimming in some way since 1926. And you've heard all about our college-bound student-athletes and potential Olympians. We also created an incredible draw for people from around the Central Coast to come to our facility. And those people spend money on gas, shopping, and at local restaurants. What you might not be aware of is that we deliver Learn to Swim, Youth Fitness, Adult Swim, Master Swimming, and that number is considerably larger. But this isn't about the Santa Maria Swim Club. We represent the entire aquatics community tonight. The Paul Nelson Aquatic Center is a place for the community to learn to swim, swim laps for mental and physical health, or because that's the only way someone can exercise. We need to double down on getting all of our community back into the pool after months of no activity. These are difficult times, and regardless of how the budget looks, it's an opportunity for out-of-the-box thinking. I'd like to bring a few things to your attention if you've not already considered them. SMSC, by our MOU, insurance, and state law, does not require lifeguards on any of our swimming programs. Our coaches and instructors are trained, and we've operated this way with the city of Santa Maria for decades. SMSC could easily pivot with USA Swimming Resources and could provide almost all of the programming the city provides, and likely more. We already run our own lessons and adult swim. Lap swim would be an easy pivot to staff and insure. We have a ready group of volunteers that's ready to assist around the pool if it means getting and keeping it open for the community. We recently spent nearly 800000 on refurbishing the pool, and any pool expert will tell you that you can't just turn the pool off for eight months to a year without damaging your new pool. Your maintenance costs are not going away. It seems from a glance at the Paul Nelson $1.1 million budget that approximately 960000 is salaries and related payroll. In short, SMSC is willing to provide lessons in lap swim programming while maintaining the programming we are already running. I'm sure other usage groups would also be willing to help. We believe this would make a significant impact on your current budget concerns that would allow you to continue offering aquatic programming through an organization that's already proven in doing so. We're ready to discuss how we can be part of a solution for everybody Please contact me if you would like to discuss this further. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Mr. Ashmore. Madam Mayor, we also have uh, Gail McNeely with us this evening. Mr. McNeely? 
I just unmuted my microphone. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Madam Mayor and City Council, last Sunday, two important things happened in Santa Maria. There was a peaceful march and protest on Broadway during the day that we can all be proud of. There was an evening event largely of people from outside Santa Maria that didn't turn out so well. The next day, our mayor said at a press conference, we hear our youth and understand their pain. If only we had listened to them for the last eight years. We should have listened to them and appointed a group of youth leaders to the mayor's task force on youth violence. We should have all been witnesses of the town hall, youth town hall, where 100 teens met at Vets Hall to look honestly at Santa Maria's major problems and find possible solutions to be included in the task force plan. We should have considered their plan at the mayor's task force meeting and included many of their strategies to combat violence and homelessness and hopelessness in our city. We should have listened when 12 brave youth leaders came to speak to council before it passed the plan, suggesting that all police officers need cultural sensitivity training to build better relationships with our youth in their neighborhoods, and we should have had added that strategy to our plan. We should have not rejected their strategy saying, city council is like your parents, they know more than you do. You have to trust our decisions. Ms. Soto, you were not on the council then, but those who were mustn't have heard our youth because they said nothing in their defense. Why do children shout? Because they feel they are not heard. Why do they get angry? Because this has gone on for too long a time. If we don't include youth in all our decisions, we are responsible for the results. Please listen to our youth. They will help us find the answers. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McNeely. Mr. Stilwell, did you have any comments you wish to make at this time? Sure, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, one comment is uh, regarding the consent item or the consent calendar and the budget item. So we do have the uh, proposed budget up on our website. It is at cityofsantamaria.org slash budgets. And I have a, a copy of a binder here that we can distribute to the city council. And um, want to make sure if all of you want hard copies or if you prefer the access to the electronic copy, we will email you each the link to the budget online. Hard copies as well? Okay. All right. Just the electronic? Okay. All right. And that concludes my uh, comments at this time. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Moving on to the consent calendar, Madam Clerk, could you please read item number three? Routine items are presented for City Council approval without discussion as a single agenda item in order to expedite the meeting. The consent calendar is approved by roll call vote with one motion, and these items are discussed only on request of Council members. Does anyone have items they wish to pull for discussion? Um, sorry. Item 3E. And I, item 3K for discussion in a separate vote. And then for item 3C, I, I just need to make a disclosure. Do I need to make a disclosure? Yes, I live in that housing complex for 3C. 3C, okay. Mm-hmm. No, I just, I was just advised to disclose it. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's start with three. Any other ones? Yeah, once again, heard she wants to pull out. Three E and three K. So three E is confirming local emergency orders and actions of the director of emergency services. Yes. Yep, I don't have any others. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so um, for me, it's more of a, um, one, it, it's a question. Um, as we are seeing ca the County of Santa Barbara moving into a reopening phase, how many of, um, like, do the current, does the local, the, does the current local emergency order still need to be in place? Like, just update, I guess, on, on how we are updating the local emergency orders based on how the county is reopening. Um. 
um, Madam Mayor, Council Member Soto. So the emergency orders we have are for our local emergency, and it's, um, we uh, take action as necessary under the emergency order to be able to address emergency situations within the city of Santa Maria. And that is uh, within the context of the public health emergency that public health is managing. So to the extent that we moved into the phase reopening, we were able to make certain modifications that we thought would help our businesses reopen in the downtown specific area. And then um, we also made certain modifications yesterday uh, regarding the curfew. And so we did adopt the local emergency order and regulation number 2020-4 yesterday to establish the um, local emergency curfew that goes into a, that went into effect yesterday and is in effect until uh, 5 a.m. on June 8th, 2020. So the um, orders we do uh, take action on are primarily for our to respond quickly to our local emergency and then we bring them to the city council monthly for council's consideration and ratification. Thank, thank you, um, Mr. Sewell. And then my last question is on the flower yeah. order. Um, can you clarify if flower shops would be able to operate within farmers markets? Yes, they would because that's a farm that's a farm product, and okay. so it'd be consistent with the farmers market. Great, thank you. And then three A, which is the second reading of the ordinance um, establishing rules of conduct for parks, plazas, and facilities. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, for this particular order, um, the reason why I, I chose to pull it from the consent calendar and ask that it be vote as a separate item is because um, Recreation and Parks Commissioners contacted me saying that this ordinance did not go through the commission. And um, they, after reading it, there, there's things that they would have liked to discuss as a commission and recommendations that they, sh they wish they would have given to the council. And so um, I know that, I, I don't know if you all got the emails, but um, they definitely would like um, for us to send it back to them in, in hopes that they can give us the recommendations that they're seeking. Um, and also to cover like transparent to make sure that we're as transparent as possible and communicating within the Commission since that's what they're there for Okay Go ahead, Mr. Cordero. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I just like to ask the um, City Attorney probably the City Attorney um, Is there a legal requirement that The Commission hear this before the council the answer to that is no it's an advisory group to try and uh, assist with policy but there's no legal requirement it's not a planning commission or something that has a requirement prior to an ordinance and oh excuse me go ahead. well okay so there's no legal requirement but it is a, a, a well-established um, protocol uh, of our system that we've been doing for many years that was put into place many years ago by councils of the past uh, in an effort to assist the city council in making these decisions. Is that about right, Mr. Stilwell? Um, it's been to the discretion of the city council. So we, the council has created the advisory commissions for areas of our city, in this case, for the Recreation and Parks Commission. Um, this ordinance did not go through the Recreation Parks Commission. The council at this point has the discretion to either pass it on the second reading, to modify it and do a new first reading, or to refer it to the Recreation and Parks Commission. We're recommending uh, adopting with the second reading as you uh, following through on your adoption of the first reading at the last meeting. Okay. Is there is there any what? Uh, I. Uh, once it's adopted, it's adopted. But um, are there provisions to hear what what the advisory council has to say and then adopt it, or can we adopt it and then unadopt it, so to speak? You know, uh, I I just kind of feel like even though there's no legal requirement to do this that if it's been a part of our um, 
protocol and process procedure for uh, a long time that we we should probably run it by them. I, I don't have any personal feelings about not running it by them. I don't know what that'll do to the vote, but uh, but uh, personally, I would not be um, offended in, in any way, shape, or form with regard to allowing them to have their say over it. Um, having said that, I would be very concerned, and I would hope that they would get in touch with uh, some of us, certainly with me. Did your parks commissioner contact you? Yes. On this? Yes. Okay. And they wanted to hear it? Yes. Okay. Madam, Madam Mayor, may yeah. I ask a question? What was the reason it came to us in the first, the, the first place? Normally, when, it, when we deal with police power issues, we bring them directly to okay. council. And this, again, was the intent was to make it consistent with the other items that we had with library and transportation okay. and transit. And it, it, with respect to police powers, my understanding is it had not normally gone through the record parks because as, as certainly in, in discussions with the director of recreation, uh, he did not uh, comment that this in any way needed to go to that, the commission. And I understand, and you're absolutely right. That, and, that, and that is a protocol we have used in the past. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Okay. I, I spoke to Mr. Mr. Posada, and I also spoke to my park commissioner, and he said um, that he, in order to get this in line with the rest of the things, uh, rest of the ordinances we have, that it was appropriate, and um, he didn't, you know, feel one way or the other about it, other than it was necessary to clean up some of this and bring it to council. I talked to my parks commissioner, and she was more than happy. She said, yeah, I'm fine with it. I said, do you think it needs to go back to the park? She said, no, it's fine. She said, we didn't meet for two months. So a lot of stuff didn't happen. So. Uh, I have a question. <clears throat> yes, Dr. Motes. Um, if the Parks and Rec Commission wants to review this, and I'm sure they've read it, there must be some objection to it. Do you know of any objection to it? Is there anything that the Parks and Rec would change, delete, or add to this? I didn't ask them for specifics, yeah. um, but I did get two park. Is my mic on? Oh, maybe yeah. you can't hear me because I'm muffled. It's hard to hear you. I'm yeah. sorry. It's on, it's on now. Um, I'm sorry. Um, so I received an email from two um, Recreation and Parks Commissioners um, stating that th they didn't give me specifics, and I, I, I didn't ask. Um, I just saw that they, they really wished that they would have had a chance to review it as a commission because there's things that they would have liked to um, dive into a little bit more and um, different recommendations that they would have made to the council. That's what they said to me. And so, I mean, I, I would be in favor of sending it back to them and have them give, them, give us their, their thoughts and Well, I, I was wondering opinion. if anybody like specifically objected to kicking ask. people out of the park that smell particularly bad, you know. We've had a lot of fun kicking that issue around. I wondered if some of them got sensitive about it. They didn't, they didn't point out specific issues with the ordinance. They just said that they wished that they would have had a chance to review it and that there's things that they would have recommended the council that were different from what we saw. Okay. I did not hear from my uh, parks commissioner, so I <clears throat> assume that she's okay with it. Yeah, I didn't hear from mine. I, I just yeah. called her and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I also spoke to Mr. Posada. So. Madam Mayor. Yes. If I may expand a bit, <clears throat> and I, I didn't say this at the when we were here two weeks ago, but it's going to be difficult to measure some things in this particular ordinance, and I liken it to I mentioned this to Dr. Motes. <clears throat> Many years ago, when the pornography issue was going through, there were some people at the Congress level that said, well, I'm not so sure I can describe pornography, but I certainly know it when I see it. And I'm not so sure that I can describe the body odor, but I'm certainly sure that I'll know it if I should smell it. And I think that it's, it's kind of like trying to adjust the temperature in a room of 300 people 
and you're never going to satisfy everyone. So there's going to be some unhappy people, and we're going to have to try to find a happy medium. What I don't care for, if the ordinance does not go through, is that you're leaving our enforcement arm in a situation where they have to turn around and say, well, I can't do anything about it. And when you leave that in the public's hands, I, I think you're, you're going to have to, you're, you're likely to have, or you will have, people say, listen, we called you to help us with this. If you don't help us, then we'll take care of it ourselves. And I, I think that in a, in a very real way, you're actually protecting these people by having the ordinance as opposed to just having to walk away and, and leave something unresolved. So I, I, as it reads now, based on what it was, I would not be opposed to passing the ordinance. In fact, I, at, the, at the moment, I'd be concerned if we didn't, knowing that it's there for us. But I would be more than willing to listen to what the other people have to say uh, or what they, what they might say. I don't know whether it'll change the vote or, or, or won't. It certainly could. Dr. Motz. Yeah, Madam Mayor, I'd like to ask our city attorney if there's any real urgency to pass this tonight or if there's any downside just to kicking it back to the I'll Parks and Rec I'll tell you Commission. what, before you, and I, just hold it a minute. Uh, Mr. Posada is on the phone and he would like to speak and maybe he could answer that for you, okay? Okay. Thank you, Mayor, members of the City Council. Uh, so I, I've been listening to the discussion and, and certainly uh, this is something that, that, that we certainly didn't want to make a big uh, to-do about. Uh, one of the things that uh, I think uh, the mayor mentioned was that we haven't had the ability to get the commission together for a regular meeting since the, the virus situation got started. So that was kind of slowing us down. Uh, the other item uh, Council Member Cordero just mentioned where these uh, situations are are few and far between. Uh, I believe that the city attorney mentioned that these rules are very similar, if not exactly similar, to those that are already in place and the rangers are already enforcing at the library and at the transit center and on, uh, on the transit buses. So it really isn't much different uh, than what's already out there. Um, what I've asked staff to do at the next commission meeting, uh, specifically um, our senior park services officer to come and talk a little bit about how enforcement would be how he sees enforcement going on uh, in the field. Uh, he can give examples of how we've used the ordinance in other situations around the city. Um, as far as uh, Council Member Mutt's comment goes, um, you know, certainly if, if the city attorney agrees and this is something that, that needs to go back to the commission, uh, you know, we can do that. It's, it's really up to how the council wants to proceed on this. Uh, we don't think that we would bring back any substance changes to the ordinance. And I have spoken to the commissioners and have gotten their input. Uh, and, you know, that's something that we can look at uh, again. I think enforcement is really the key here and how the officers use their discretion in, in discharging these duties. Thank you, Mr. Masasa. Oh, yes, Mr. Watson. I, I would I would encourage council to move forward with this for the one reason that the enforcement piece clarifies how enforcement would be done with respect to minor violations, warning notices, and uh, daily ejectments, because that currently is not um, the standard. Right now we have infractions and that sort of thing, and it's a fairly heavy-handed. The one thing to remember is if the commission does have substantive changes, we can come back and provide a technical mm -hmm. amendment, which eliminates an offensive um, uh, code section. Um, but, but the other issue would be, obviously, the delay when our parks and facilities will be highly utilized over the next several months. This does eliminate any confusion or um, uncertainty as to that, and we can always, again, rely on the discretion of the uh, park rangers to 
effectuate what we believe is, again, the Santa Maria way, which I've been consistent with, which is education first and trying to um, de-escalate any kind of concerns, but also not leave it uh, to individuals who are sharing park space in a time of some fairly high tensions. Yeah. Um, that's the other reason to, to, to move forward with it, so at least we have the tools, and we can always come back and, and clarify and, and fix things later. With that, that Madam Mayor, I'd like to make a motion. Uh, Ms. Waterfield? Yes, I'd like, I'd like to make a motion uh, that we adopt the consent calendar as submitted, and we can omit 3K if we want to vote on that separately. Second. Okay, a motion and a second. So, uh, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, any further discussion? Hearing none, Madam Clerk, can you please call the roll? Uh, Council, Council Member Waterfield? Aye. Council Member Motes? Aye. Council Member Cordero? Aye. Council Member Soto? Aye. And Madam Mayor Patino? Aye. Uh, Madam Mayor, I'd like to make an, a motion on item 3K as submitted. Okay, is there a second? Second. Pardon me? To approve, yes, to approve. Second. And second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, would you please call the roll? Councilmember Waterfield? Aye. Councilmember Motes? Aye. Councilmember Soto? No. Councilmember Cordero? No, and not until we get it back. Madam Mayor Patino? Aye. Motion carries. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Posada. Okay, um, going on now to item number four. Uh, the City Council will receive an update regarding the coronavirus. Okay, Mr. Stilwell, would you like to do the introductions? Sure, thank you, Madam Mayor and members of the Council. This is our opportunity at each Council meeting to provide the City Council and the public with an update on the pandemic emergency and how we're addressing it in the City of Santa Maria. Um, this uh, meeting, we have uh, um, Chief Leonard Champion, our fire chief, will be able to present the coordinated activities that we've had in the city and some of the st statistics specific to the city of Santa Maria. We also have Glenn Morris, who uh, is helping our uh, businesses reopen in accordance with our re phase reopening plan. And he'll be able to explain the reopening efforts, um, how we're able to get our economy back going, folks back to work, and the processes that they have to follow on the county website to do so. And um, then we also have Chief of Police Phil Hansen here uh, as well for updates on recent activities and answer any questions the council may have. And we can start off again with Chief Champion. Good evening, Mayor Patino, City Council, staff, and viewing public. Thank you for this time to give you an update uh, on where we're at in the county and in Santa Maria related to COVID. This first slide is a new slide off of the Public Health website. This is a reopening metric, metrics dashboard. And so it gives um, a lot of great information. There's a lot of graphs and data that is going to be used to kind of give us a snapshot in time and how we're doing as we are moving through these phases and able to stay and maintain in a phase advance or go back if needed. So this dashboard on the public health website is really an informative website and um, would encourage everybody to go on and, and look at it. In this graph here, that top number uh, basically is showing where we're at in cases in the county. We're at 1,669 cases. The line just below that is those that have recovered. So that's 1,523. So that is encouraging that we're seeing such a high recovery rate. Current active cases in the county are 134. And so this, this graph right here is basically looking at the past 14 days. The um, metrics in which this dashboard is, is showing is going to be related to hospital stabilization. I know we've had Sue Anderson from Marion Hospital talking to us about the status of the hospital, how many beds are available, and those sorts of things. It also is going to be tracking positive testing, daily testing capacity, hospital surge capacity, and adequate PPE, or personal protective equipment. As we look to how this is related to each city in the county, 
you'll notice that unfortunately we are leading the charge in cases. This graph shows the last 14 days uh, that we have had 117 cases in Santa Maria. The public health director, Vaughn De Reynoso, has acknowledged the uh, amount of cases we're seeing here in the county. There's a lot of questions on why. Staff has reached out to public health to get assistance and resources so that we could possibly identify and help curve this, uh, these numbers. Unfortunately, uh, the director and Dr. Anzord are kind of stumped. Um, there is no particular area in our community that is targeted. Um, there aren't any districts or sections, businesses or gathering points that we can say that is where we need to focus on. So we do have some assistance from public health in that we're going to take a closer look. They're gonna start sharing more data with us so that we can take steps to get that number down. I was just advised today by our public information officer, um, Mark Vandekamp, that today we had some signs that are similar to the one here in council chambers that is going up. We're doing everything we can to get the message out so the public is aware of what they need to do to help us reduce our numbers. This is another campaign that uh, local businesses, staff have been involved with, again, trying to do what we can. These are on some of the Facebook pages. Um, and again, we're trying to make sure that information is getting out there in both Mixteco, uh, Spanish, and English. This again is another resource for the public community Public testing is going on at the Fair Park. It's going on in Guadalupe now. Uh, the, the site in Lompoc is transitioning to solving, I believe, Thursday and actually operational on Friday to kind of capture this, the solving San Yanez area. Um, and then, of course, down in Santa Barbara. So this is um, for anybody that would like to get tested that are showing signs or symptoms, they can go get tested free of charge. And lastly, I just wanted to show the dashboard metrics that I was referring to earlier. There are many more graphs, many more charts that are very beneficial. So I would encourage anybody to go there. And I would like to close with just an inspirational account of things going on in our community and not necessarily COVID related, but regarding the demonstration the other night, I, I noticed that there were a number of businesses and community members that rallied and stepped up to make a difference uh, on the aftermath. They stepped up and um, took, took charge to help clean up the damage and vandalism that had been done. So, you know, there are a lot of good things going on out there. And so just wanted to highlight that as a positive thing. End of report. Madam, Thank you, Chief. And Madam Mr. Mayor, if there aren't um, questions at this point for Chief Champion, he did. Uh, Chief Champion did mention the the new uh, face covering order that the county uh, released since we had a lot since the council met last, and um, they did provide uh, frequently asked questions for the public, and I think the council has them, but I can summarize them real quickly is because the mask order is new and there's a number of questions about it. So the uh, purpose of the health order is to. Um, temporarily require the use of face coverings to slow the spread of COVID-19 as much as possible. The types of face coverings, um, what, what type of face coverings comply with the health order? And it's a face covering made of cloth, fabric, or permeable materials without holes that covers the nose, mouth, and surrounding areas of the face. Who must wear a face covering? All individuals over the age of 13 years old, unless there's exceptions. When must individuals wear a face covering? when they're in line to enter a business, when they're conducting business through a drive through when they're obtaining health care, mental health, or veterinary services, when they're using public transportation, when they're driving public transportation, and when they're at work at an off-site location, when they're interacting with people or working in a space that people of, uh, members of the public attend. Face masks are not required when a person is working alone and if they're in a stable work group of not more than 12 people or if they're um, under two years of age or driving alone, or if they have a medical reason to not wear a face mask. 
And must I wear a face mask outdoors? No, a face mask is recommended but not ordered while engaged in outdoor activity. And where can I get face covering? And the county lists three sites. It's the Santa Barbara County Administration Building in Santa Barbara, Santa Barbara County Healthcare Center, also in Santa Barbara, and the County Healthcare Center up here in Santa Maria on Center Point Parkway. And Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. Question. Yes, one question. Yes. 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 Um, Chief Champion, you mentioned that the health officers are are kind of stumped as to why the number of cases in the city of Santa Maria continue to rise so rapidly. Um, so I'm wondering, are they getting any help from the state to try and figure out what what like if there's a common denominator? Yeah, we've asked, uh, thank you for that question. We've asked for specifics, n not personal information that would violate any HIPAA laws, but in general, in terms, how can they provide information that they're tracking because they're the ones that are holding that information with tracing that could help us. And uh, according to Dr. Anzorg, it's, it, it's across the map, it's kind of universal. There's nothing that is saying that this is a concentrated area that we can focus on. So the, the health director, the doctor, are, they, they don't, they're unable to help us identify a particular part of our community that we would be able to address. And then my, my next question is, um, can you explain to me once again what the criteria is for reopening? I believe that we have X number of cases that we need to fall under in order for us to be able to remain open or to continue to reopen. Are we meeting those numbers even, even with the number of cases that we're seeing in our city? Yes, there are criteria for us to stay within a phase, if I understand your question mm -hmm. correctly. Uh, there are about five bullet points that they highlighted in this news release today. And I talked briefly in general about the headings. Uh, hospital stabilization metric is to determine whether the county meets the seven day average of less than 5% daily percentage. So they're not seeing an increase in admittance at the hospital more than 5% um, than what they're seeing now. You go on to the next metrics and that is a testing results metric that demonstrates that testing positivity over the seven, past seven days is less than 8%. So a lot of these are percentage driven mm -hmm. from the baseline. I but think on, on that one we're like at 3%. So we're way under. That yeah. That's correct. Okay. Hospital capacity, um, making sure that the hospitals have the ability to absorb uh, a surge in numbers. Personal protective gear that we have all of our first responders um, adequately protected with uh, PPE. Okay, no, thank you. Um, for some reason I was stuck on like, there's a certain number, right? Um, but the percentage part mm -hmm. makes sense. Um, so thank you for the clarification. Sure. Uh, Chief Champion, let me ask you, how many tests, have, I'm surprised they're still testing at the Fair Park. Is this the third week now? Yeah, I believe they started testing in the beginning. I know, like things become a blur. I understand May. that. Yeah. Do you know how many we have tested out there? I do have that number. Probably up in 2,000 or something. Mm -hmm. oh, that's, that's okay. I'm just curious. Yeah, I know there's still testing going on. From uh -huh. what I understand, it is Wednesday through Friday. There is testing available to the public five days a week. So um, you still have to make an appointment and they would just tell you, you have an appointment in Santa Maria at the Fair Park on Wednesday at this time or Thursday mm -hmm. or Friday. Um, they did open up the testing over in Guadalupe, which is a big help. And then of course they're, they're starting to move some testing sites, the one from Lompoc into Solving, just again to um, provide opportunities for uh, all, all citizens within the county. They don't have yeah. to travel as far. Okay, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Cordero. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Chief, uh, I was talking to some, uh, some people that had gone to the testing at the fairgrounds. There were no symptoms or anything, but they were, pr they were very pleased with the fact that they were now in the system. Do you know what that means? 
because they didn't know what it meant. Uh, huh. they were happy. They're now in the system. Um, is this a system of data that they're using that were they're they're preparing or something, or do you know what they meant by that, it, or was this just something they came up with? Yeah, it, it certainly is uh, helpful, but it's only a a, uh, a specific spot in time. So it only tells the public health director and officer that this is uh, how many people have been tested in the community, how many have tested positive, but those that have tested negative, the following day they could be exposed and actually uh, obtain the virus. So it's just going to tell those officials at that point in time whether or not you are infected or not. Um, so it's limited in its um, ability to help. I so think every, that every day it's a zone snapshot. It mm -hmm. is. Yeah, it is. Okay, thank you, sir. Sure. Thank you very much. Mr. Stilwell? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, if there are no other questions about the medical situation, then we can uh, transfer to Glenn Morris about the reopening efforts and then follow with uh, Chief Hansen on uh, the recent events. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the council. It's a pleasure to be back with you again this evening. Um, wanted to talk with you a little bit about the reopening, mm -hmm. and that's the, uh, the area that we are very focused on, is getting our businesses back open, operating, and putting our neighbors back to work. Um, to date, we, are, we have seen about 300 local businesses that have completed the county's self-certification process and declared themselves um, clean and ready to open their business. Um, many of them are using our safe and open campaign, which is available through the chamber. Um, it's a social media campaign that we use to help spread the information about which businesses are open. Uh, and we encourage all businesses uh, to do those two steps. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that self-certification piece looks like uh, in, in just a moment. Um, our resource page on the santamaria.com website continues to be updated. Uh, most recently, we collaborated with the chambers throughout the county and our neighboring county to source a list of businesses in our region that sell the various um, PPE and sanitation and disinfecting supplies. Uh, that, that, uh, that, that resource is now available if people are looking uh, for places that they can buy hand sanitizer or disinfecting or masks. Um, that site, that page in, it, by itself last month had over 2,500 individuals visit the site. So it's um, something that we work at very carefully and very hard to make sure that the information there is the most current and accurate that we can come up with. Um, on the other side of that, we're, we're trying very hard to promote our businesses and help, um, help drive traffic to them as they do reopen. Um, in the last several weeks, we've generated over a thousand uh, visits to our website, in particular the dining and the shopping pages, um, referrals to businesses that are now open so that people understand what's available today. And that, as you can imagine, um, changes uh, by the hour. Um, I, I wanted to take a few minutes and specifically talk about what the process look is that businesses need to go through. Um, this is detailed on the county's website on the recovery sbc.org um, page that Chief Champion mentioned earlier. Um, there is a reopen your business subpage there that goes through the criteria that businesses need to follow in order to certify. Um, let me be clear that the only businesses that are allowed to certify to date are those that are, have been open or are now allowed to open in stage two of the state's four stage criteria. Um, we anticipate that the criteria for stage three will be released soon. Um, I was on a, on a webinar earlier this afternoon with the county. Uh, they indicated that the earliest they will look at the data. So let me back up. The, you, you'll recall that earlier uh, last week, the governor kind of changed strategies a little and indicated that the state would now indicate the how the, the, the communities would reopen in the different stages but it would be up to the county health officials to determine the when. Santa Barbara County announced today, or mentioned today on this webinar, that the earliest they will consider their data 
um, and, and the chief mentioned what those data points are that they're tracking, will be next Friday, June the 12th. So after they pull the data from this two-week window, um, they will then e evaluate that and make a determination about whether or not Santa Barbara County is ready to move to stage three. To date, every business that is open, those that have always been open because they were listed initially as essential, or those that were allowed to reopen in stages one or two, um, should go to the county site and complete a self-certification. This indicates to the community that their business is prepared and ready to be open in a safe manner. There are six steps that they should fall that they are required to go through. The first is simply to review the state and county guidelines associated with their particular industry. And there are probably 15 or 20 industry categories that are detailed on the website today. And under each of those, there is a set of criteria and there is a checklist. They should initially go through and review those, understand what they are. And, and to the extent that businesses are not yet open but are considering it, I would encourage them to begin there understanding what those guidelines are going to look like so that when they are ready to move forward, they're prepared. The second step is that they need to assess their own operations and identify those areas that could potentially be at risk or could be perceived by the community as risk points. The third step is that they need to create an implementation plan. The county does have a template on their website that businesses can use or they can use their own form. They do not need to use the templates that's there. It's simply provided as a default tool um, if a business wants to use it. It's a fairly easy fill in the blank kind of a, pro of a form. Uh, I would tell you that's what we did at the chamber. We went through and answered the questions on their, on their form and we now have that available. Um, so that's the third step is to, to complete that plan. The plan talks about things like how will we clean our business, right? How will we train our employees? Um, how will we um, change our operations to make sure that, that there's adequate spacing between customers when they're queuing up in lines or circulating throughout the business? It's very common sense information, but you do have to have this plan. It needs to be available in your business um, for people to review if, if they ask what. You do not have to submit it to the county. You simply have to have it completed and available. You then should go through and, 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 and complete the checklist that's provided in the state and county guidelines. Again, it's kind of a double check against your plan to make sure that all of the items on the checklist are addressed. The fifth item is to complete an attestation. And this is simply a, a statement. There's a form that, that is on the county's website that you fill out directly on the site. It asks a bunch of questions. Um, that, 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 that you know, describes your business and then essentially asks you to, uh, to affirm that the steps that you are required to take have been taken, that you have a plan, that you have trained your people, all of those kinds of things. Um, the form also includes two questions that are, uh, that are important uh, and that are location specific. So one item that I would point out in the, in the form, you're asked to put in the city uh, that, where your business is located. It's important that when you choose that, it's the, where you're located, not your mailing address, right? Uh, because many of our neighbors in Orkut use a Santa Maria mailing address, but it's important that they would select the unincorporated county location because the rules that they need to follow are dictated by the county. For those that, are, that, that fall into the city's rules are those that are located physically within the city of Santa Maria. So you indicate which city, and then there are these two questions. The first one talks about any modifications that you need to make to your business. And it asks you to indicate whether you're making no modifications, very minor modifications, moving a rack or a display, or if you're needing to make major modifications like adding a wall or changing the physical location of your kitchen, uh, those kinds of things. That information is shared with the city or the appropriate jurisdiction. And if there is that major modification that uh, would require an inspection, then, then you can coordinate on that. Um, and then the third, the last question that they ask is whether or not your business would like to take advantage of the relaxed um, 
requirements around the use of public um, right-of-way or private um, parking areas uh, associated with your business in order to expand. Uh, both the county and the unincorporated community and the city of Santa Maria have relaxed some of those rules and have expressed a willingness to work with businesses to accommodate uh, the use of outdoor space in adjacent to businesses to allow them to place additional dining tables uh, or other ways to accommodate their business. Um, so there is, a, there is a, a question on that regard. And again, uh, if a business indicates that, then that flags it so that we can follow up and work with them on those requirements. Um, once that form is completed, you submit that to the county. Uh, and, and then you sub at the end of it, 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 it brings you to a little um, certificate that looks like the, the, the one on the far left of the screen up there. Uh, and you can print that, post that on your window. And, and what that really does is it begins to tell the public um, that they can have confidence in interacting with your business. And we think that's really the, the, the real advantage to this process uh, is that it gives people a common set of understandings around how a business that's displaying this signage um, is operating and functioning and begins to rebuild that public trust that we're all going to need uh, in order for us uh, to return to uh, a normal, uh, if that ever happens, uh, something close to normal um, interaction in our economy. Uh, with that, Mayor, I'd be happy to answer any questions or um, take any uh, feedback that you have or members of the council. Any questions, Mr. Morris? Oh, let me ask you, so you said 300 businesses. Is that in Santa Maria or is that Santa Maria and Orchid area? No, so th thank you, Mayor. That's a good question. So. Um, Probably every two or three days, the county um, pulls that data off of these attestation forms, sorts it by communities, and sends to the city manager who shares with us um, who has done that. And so those are the ones that are specifically tagged to the city of Santa Maria. Um, okay. and, and I would follow up with that just by saying that once we know who those are, we're then reaching out to them to offer them um, the, the social media campaign and any other support uh, that they need once we know that they're reopened. And I, I hope the answer is really good on this one. Do we have a large amount of our businesses that are reopening and are planning on reopening? Yeah, to the, to, to the best of our knowledge, I think um, you know, the, those that are prepared and, and have the supplies, have all of their you know, kind of um, you know, uh, preparations done are reopening. Uh, many others uh, we're aware of are, are working through that process and getting ready. Because as a, as a city, they had so many essential services, a lot of people were open anyway, you know, not to the extent that they're going to be open now, but I, I was hoping that a lot of them would be really, really, would, would still be there and not gone. True. And, and Mayor, actually, you know, obviously there are more than 300 or whatever number we, we're at today, mm -hmm. businesses open in the city of Santa Maria. Um, you've pointed out rightly in, in a number of occasions that many of our businesses um, offered essential services and, and never really were forced to completely close. Uh, one of the things that we're trying to, the messages we're trying to get out is I don't know that many of them understand that, that the county has now asked that they also go through this self-certification. I think they feel like, well, we've always been operating, we're still operating, nothing has changed for us. Um, but again, I think because now that the, the, this um, this communication to the public that you know to, to tell them we're operating safely is beginning to get out there i think it's important that all of these businesses go back and do it so that people don't question right they don't go in and go well your neighbor's got to sign up that says they're safe and you don't so maybe i'm not coming there anymore so it's really in their own best interest to go back i, I think for our and you know again the chamber is a simple operation uh, compared to many of our businesses but i you know I went through and filled out the form for us, and I think it took me 15 minutes. So if I can do it that quickly, for most of our businesses, it's probably even easier. Thank you. Any questions? Mr. Cordero. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Glenn, is there, uh, are there any common denominators, either positive or negative, that you're learning from the businesses? And if there's any negatives, are we able to help with them? Uh, not that the city would be able to do as much but perhaps yourself or, or maybe the city could. So uh, thank you, Councilman Cordero, for that question. I, I think we're just starting to really learn, um, you know, what the struggles are. Um, you know, I think we've been concerned for a long time that, that many of our businesses 
kind of hung on to get through the last two, two and a half months and that, um, you know, maybe with the hope that once they turned the switch back on, things would go back to, to really strong. Uh, and, and I don't think that's going to be the case. I think many of our businesses are going to come back and, you know, they've lost two and a half months worth of income. Their employees may have moved on. There's going to be challenges. Um, I don't think we know the common denominators yet, but we're beginning to really reach out and identify what those are. Um, one of the things that we are working on right now is creating a, a little strike team of business advisors, folks in the community who are um, seasoned, who have um, track records of success in operating and managing businesses, who can, on a volunteer basis, um, meet with businesses who are expressing concern, help them understand what their kind of core issue is or their first issue is, and then connect them to resources in the community. Uh, or in the region that can provide the support they need. So um, that's an area that we want to be very agile in and, and are looking forward to um, providing that kind of support to all businesses. And I should make clear um, that, that uh, membership in the chamber is, is not a prerequisite for support um, at this point in time. We're here for Thank every you. business in the community. Thank you. Dr. Motes. Yeah, Glenn, uh, <clears throat> behind yes. me here. Uh, <laughs> How many businesses are you aware of that have decided not to reopen and are going to close permanently? Yeah, to date I'm not aware. Thank you, Dr. Most, for that question. I, I'm not aware of a large number of them. I think, you know, most of our businesses, the vast majority of our businesses plan to reopen and, and return. Um, our, our, you know, our, our plan is to help as many of them make that successful a transition as possible. Madam Mayor, if I could Mr. also... Sowell? To reiterate what uh, Glenn Morris is saying in response to um, Councilmember Cordero's question about the common denominators of the successes, I think we're seeing the businesses that are engaged on this process and are understanding what they need to do are the ones that we're seeing are able to reopen quicker than the others. And so and Glenn mentioned that uh, stage three, phase three is coming up here at, in some point in a couple weeks. And so we'd encourage the businesses that are no not, that are not currently allowed to reopen under the health guidelines and the governor's order to begin looking at these criteria. There'll be similar criteria for stage three in that they'll have to have a safety plan. They'll have to promise to implement it. They're going to have to have mitigation efforts, whether it's masks or cleaning supplies. And so we're, we're seeing that the businesses that know that and are able to plan for that are the ones that we're seeing now reopening. And it's not just the, the corporations. I mean, we do see Kohl's and Buffalo Wild Wings and some of our bigger corporations in there that have the corporate support behind them. But even our, a lot of our smaller taquerias and, and the rest of the um, um, businesses in the mall have gone through this process. And it's really them just, in, like Mr. Morris said, spending the 15 minutes realizing, okay, you're going to have to have a hand sanitizer station. You're going to have to have queuing on the floor. And just some of these things are what we're noticing the businesses that have reopened and are jumping back into it have been able to do effectively. Thank you. And Dr. Motes. Just one more question, maybe to our city manager. When are we going to reopen city council chambers to the public? Thank, thank you, um, Dr. Motes, and uh, through the mayor. So we are going through the same process as well. We did issue internal guidelines to the departments of what our attestation process will be. And we'll have the um, certificate, certificates on the doors as well to let our public know as well that we're following these safety guidelines. And we're looking at, um, we wouldn't be able to reopen the library and our community centers till phase three, but we're doing a modified reopening of those. Um, and then phase two, uh, we can open the rest of the businesses that have been opened as essential services. And so we anticipate having our council chambers back open as they were at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, at probably the next council meeting or maybe the one thereafter but where and we think it'll our modifications will probably be similar to the ones that we had at the front end of the pandemic where we had social distancing in the audience we had people having to queue at the microphone um, and we had limited staff here so I think you know it won't go back to normal but it will go back to how it was last when, when can Anna and I go back to the diet? <laughs> Probably never. Uh, phase, phase four. <laughs> that's phase four, actually. So that's uh, phase, phase three. So right now, um, no gatherings over 100 and, and no big events. And there's some specialty things that can't be done, like um, 
the services with close physical contact. And so that will be stage three, but then stage four is the complete reopening where we can go back to being next to each other without masks and without social distancing. So that will be a while. Probably, Ms. yeah, several. I think the governor says months, not weeks. Months? Months. For stage four, when we actually are back to how it used to be. Or some modification. Sounds like a song. Uh, Mr. Cordero. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Glenn, what's the couple of the main points on going from stage two to stage three. Can you tell me that? I, I'm sure that Ben's going to ask me that in the morning, so. <laughs> um, so so I, I haven't actually memorized the, the criteria that the, the, the state has put out. I think the, the chief pointed to where they're at on the website on the public health site. There, there are those metrics that, are, um, that have to be hit, uh, and the county has to determine that, that we're at that stage. Okay, thank you. I, I don't know if you know this, Mr. Morris, but, but what's going on with the churches? I know uh, First Christian opened last Sunday and Calvary opened last Sunday. I don't, I don't know, if, you know, the others that did, but what are they doing? Do you know? Sure, Mayor. Yeah, I was actually speaking with um, Tim Mossholder, who's the president of the local um, Pastors Network yesterday, uh, and he indicated it's, it's mixed. There, there are a number of churches that have begun to... Um, bring their parishioners back um, again under very modified conditions. Uh, um, I believe that their requirements are no more than 25% of their rated capacity or 100 people, whichever is smaller. Um, I, I believe one of the church, I think it was First Christian, um, used multiple spaces to, 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 to add mm -hmm. a few more people uh, to their service. But there are still a number of churches that are continuing to um, operate kind of using technology and, and other um, means to, to minister to their, to their congregations. And um, one pastor in particular mentioned that, you know, until the, uh, they can add value um, beyond just socialization, they, they think that they're providing ministry um, effectively now. And, and so they're, they're willing to wait and keep their folks um, safe because they think they're being effective. So uh, it's kind of all over the the spectrum still at this point thank you very much any other questions None. the assess yeah. sorry madam Mayor. The, as the assessment um the 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 identification of the risk points that's not a form that they have to complete right? it's, it's not no like that's really plan. just thinking through your business understanding where those are and then addressing them in that plan that you have to put together great thank you thank you my pleasure thank you mayor back to you mr stillwell Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the council. So um, that's, we're excited to have the reopening. Again, it's, uh, we want to make sure people are safe, but we want to get our economy going, have people get back to work. And obviously our budget is primarily driven by consumer spending. And so was, to the extent folks are out there shopping and, and uh, supporting our businesses, it helps our budget and our ability to continue to provide services at the levels we provide. Um, next, we have uh, Chief, uh, uh, Police Chief Hansen, who can provide an update on current affairs with uh, the police department and the safety of our community. Good evening, Chief Hansen. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening, Madam Mayor and members of the council. Um, I really didn't uh, prepare a formal presentation for you tonight, but I felt that given the gravity of the circumstances that we've all faced this last week, uh, that it would be appropriate for me to, to appear in person and be here to answer any questions or concerns you might have. Uh, I will start out with just a few things uh, uh, that may be of interest to you. We have uh, our uh, crews that we sent down to Los Angeles returned today. Uh, our officers who were down there, we had about uh, 10 officers down there serving for the last four days. And uh, our, we also have officers deployed to San Francisco and they will be returning tomorrow. Uh, there are a number of um, events that are planned still that we are aware of. Um, tonight there's an event in Lompoc and we're assisting Lompoc Police Department with their event. Uh, tomorrow we understand that there is a, an event planned in Napomo. And then on Thursday there will be simultaneous events uh, in uh, Santa Maria, City of San Luis Obispo and also Lompoc. And so, uh, with that in mind, I've uh, taken some steps uh, within the department to uh, increase our staffing levels and, um, and uh, be as best prepared for anything that comes our way as we possibly can. Very proud of the, uh, the restraint and the, uh, 
the discipline that our personnel showed uh, recently and the, the situations that we had in the city here. We've got a very disciplined, highly trained police force and, uh, and we're ready for what comes our way as best we can. And uh, with that, I would just open it up to any questions that you might have or concerns. I, I, as I said, I thought it would be appropriate to appear and be here in case anybody had anything. Can you tell me about what the sequence of events were on Sunday? Uh, yes, ma'am. There was a, uh, a protest plan. Now, one thing that was uh, unusual about that, um, and my glasses keep fogging up there, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was unusual is that uh, uh, there was really nothing, uh, no one we could attribute uh, the organization of that event to. Uh, there was a flyer that appeared on the internet and uh, uh, there was nobody, what normally happens when there's an event is we'll try to uh, liaison with the organizers and uh, tell them that we're here to provide them with a peaceful venue, you know, to exercise their rights and, and uh, and we get together with, with a representative of the, of the organizations that are putting it on and uh, we liaison well with them and we typically have a very successful, very peaceful event. We know what to expect, they know what to expect of us and we make arrangements to, to provide a safe venue. Uh, in this particular case there was no parent organization, if you will, no organization or organizer for us to talk to. So uh, we were, you know, a little bit out in the cold and, and quite frankly given the um, the nature of the protest, the subject matter, we felt it was best to provide distance uh, uh, and uh, not, you know, um, encourage any kind of confrontation. And so what we did was uh, we stayed off in the distance a couple blocks away and we, we provided traffic control and adjusted to their movements. And uh, for several hours it was a peaceful, you know, uh, protest and I was very pleased with the, uh, the uh, progression of it, if you will. And um, it, um, it did die down to where we thought it was uh, pretty much over. We were down to what we estimated to be about 50 or 60 people. But then it swelled uh, to uh, close to 300 again, we felt. And we think that's the power of social media. And um, it was a different tenor to the group, if you will. And uh, so we were sort of in a reactionary mode at that point. Uh, if I send in just a few officers, I know there's been... Uh, I've had a lot of accolades for the performance of our personnel, but there's been some uh, criticism as well, and you're always going to get that to some degree, that we didn't move in faster and do some things quicker. But uh, if you go in in something like that with less than the proper number of personnel, what you invite is conflict. Uh, uh, if you're trying to focus on arrests, you're always going to have, uh, you're going to lose a couple officers to every arrest that you make usually. and. Uh, uh, I wanted very much to avoid uh, a situation where it fed into um, a media problem and a problem of appearance and a, and a violent confrontation that was unnecessary. So we built our resources up to where we could go in there and force and do it in an orderly fashion. And as we did, uh, it broke up and uh, I'm glad to say property damage was actually quite limited considering the number of people that, uh, that we had. I've been in touch personally with the mall director and whatnot on that. And uh, quite frankly, I think it was a success. Now, going forward, uh, my plan is to have more personnel available at all times and to be able to speed up that um, process of gathering resources so that uh, we can respond even quicker should we have another incident like that. And I'll say that the, uh, the um, program that is planned for Thursday, I've been in touch with the organizers already. That they're very fine people. Uh, uh, LaWanda Lyons Pruitt is an absolutely wonderful person that is on my uh, Chief's Advisory Council. We keep in touch with one another and uh, I'm sure that, uh, that uh, I'm planning a, a very uh, orderly and, and uh, appropriate event for Thursday. Oh, Ms. Waterfield. Uh, how will you keep people from infiltrating this peaceful march on Thursday? Do you have, uh, are you going to have officers set up to monitor what's going on? We don't give away all on? the secrets, ma'am. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, um, that's where the organizers are so important. Because if you have responsible people that are organizing an event, then they can share with us what the plans are. And they can share with us if there are people that have, uh, apparently aren't going to go along with 
with the plan, the program. So on Sunday, you didn't have responsible organizers? On Sunday, we had uh, contact with some people, but there was no organizer of record, if you will. There was no, if you look at the flyer for Thursday's event, for instance, it clearly says who is sponsoring this event, uh -huh. who, who is behind this. That was not the case on, on Sunday, so there really wasn't any uh, resource, uh, solid resource that we had. We did have some people that were uh, were very cooperative with, with us and trying to tell us what their factions were trying to do, but there were other factions there that came from outside that were simply not going along with the program. And where will the march be on, on Thursday? Uh, I believe it is planned for here in the, right. uh, the Cook and uh, Broadway intersection okay. again, or the four corners, if you will. Okay. Now, I know some of the, disrupt the disruptors that were here then moved on to San Luis Obispo mm -hmm. and then moved up to Paso Robles. Yeah, yeah the same faces are appearing in, in some of those places. Yes, ma'am. Any other questions? Dr. Motes? Chief, I heard there, was some, uh, there were some problems in San Luis Obispo. You know anything about that? Uh, they had a, um, they did have an event in San Luis Obispo. There was a, um, um, I understand the San Luis Obispo PD uh, declared an unlawful assembly and utilized uh, chemical munitions and whatnot to disperse that. And I know there was uh, some damage done on, I believe, Higuera Street. But uh, I'm not privy to, you know, all the details and, and what their thought process was and how that went. But yes, they did have a significant event yesterday. Are the demonstrators allowed to get into the street and close our streets? Uh, if we let them get in the street and close the street, for, uh, I'll give you an example, sir. Uh, on Sunday's event, uh, we had information that they wanted to go in the street, take a knee for eight minutes, and uh, it was a symbolic uh, of the, uh, the event in, uh, in Minnesota. And, uh, we didn't have a problem with that. We'll shut that down and let them do that. And there's a, uh, everything in life is you look at it and you do a risk benefit analysis. You know, what are you gaining? What are you losing? What happened later on in the night was not acceptable. Uh, but unless you have the resources there to go out and, and really uh, uh, attend to that properly, then you end up in a bigger problem. So you have to look at, once again, it's a risk benefit analysis. What are we, what are we losing by having an intersection closed for a little while as opposed to uh, perhaps a violent confrontation that you're not prepared for? So. I understand Sheriff Brown was very generous, generous in lending us some of his sheriffs. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, actually, we've got a, a great relationship um, uh, with uh, our mutual aid partners, as I said, we, we have a, a strong contingent in Lompoc tonight. Uh, Sheriff Brown was very generous uh, Sunday night, as was uh, Sheriff Parkinson uh, sent uh, personnel down to us. So when you've got the right numbers to deal with something, then, it, then you can deal with it in a different way. But if you try to do it uh, with less than those numbers, then you're, you're kind of courting a disaster, to tell you the truth. And, uh, and that's not what we're going to do. We're going to do things smartly in this city. Ms. Soto? Absolutely. Uh, sure, absolutely. Um, um, I'm proud to say you have a very disciplined, very well-trained police force in this in this city, and and honestly, it begins with the culture and within a department. Uh, you can train people uh, till the cows come home, but if the culture is is not solid, then it's not going to stick. That training. We've got a culture in this in this city, in this department of service, and of treating people with respect. Uh, 
I won't uh, tolerate uh, treating our own employees or each other with a lack of respect, and then and, and that emanates from outside the building. We treat each other right in the building, and then we go out and we treat the public right. And uh, when, we, when we breach that, and it's very rare when we have a breach, we treat it seriously, okay? So we have a strong culture. We have an excellent record in this city. And, um, and then we augment that with, with strong training. Uh, last year, in the fall, uh, each sworn officer and our dispatchers uh, all received eight hours of training in um, uh, crisis intervention training, which uh, focuses on dealing with people, particularly developmentally dis uh, disabled people and mentally ill people that are in crisis, going through crisis an eight-hour training block in that. In January of this year, uh, all sworn personnel received an eight-hour block in de-escalation, uh, de-escalation high-tension, high high-risk events. Uh, later this year, for the fall, I have an eight-hour block planned in what we call principled policing, and that includes a, a strong emphasis on uh, racial profiling and, and implicit bias. So, uh, when you think about a police department, there is, there's so much training that needs to be done and uh, so much tactical training, so much firearms training, so much uh, training in the law and policy, uh, pursuit driving, you name it. Uh, and then, uh, but then we make sure that we build in these other things that are very, very important too, that just deal with how to deal with people with respect, how to deal with people in crisis, how to deal with... Uh, differences in cultural and racial differences and things like that. So uh, it's, a, it's a moving target and it's something that I think we're, we're flying very high, but it works hard. You gotta work hard to keep that up there and, and keep at the highest levels, but that's what we're doing. That's why uh, training budgets and things like that are so important. The city's been very generous with our, our police training budget and, uh, and that's an important thing. Uh, it's, you, you get what you pay for when it comes to that kind of thing. Mr. Cordero. Thank, thank you, Madam Mayor. <clears throat> Chief, there were no injuries uh, as a result of this? No, uh, sir. Significant? No, sir. I think any time we enter into something like this that there's no injuries, that that's probably a win right there. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll add one thing, because I know it comes up. I know you'll be asked about it. I was at the press conference yesterday. How many arrests? How many arrests did you have out there? And uh, there are times when uh, uh, arrests are not the primary goal, and you know this, sir. Uh, sure. It's it's stopping the activity that's going on, and uh, as I said, when you start getting into arrest in a situation like that, and we'll make arrests when we can and when they're appropriate, but there are times when the goal is to stop the activity and move people on and move them out of the area, as opposed to breaking off in small factions and trying to do arrests that, that can end up, once again, in a violent confrontation and a depletion of your resources, too. So. There's a lot that goes in to doing something like this and doing it right. And, uh, and I think we did a, a pretty darn good job the other night. I know that's self-serving, but I think we did a good job of that. I have to say that I'd like to echo what uh, Misoto said. <clears throat> I kind of scared myself uh, uh, in the last few days and realized that I've got nearly 50 years of involvement with this, uh, with this police department. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that I don't believe we've ever been any better qualified uh, in the decision-making processes that your officers have to go through in order to do the things that, that, that the men and women have to do. So I would echo what uh, Ms. Soto said and that uh, the men and women deserve a hand. Well, thank you, sir. Any other questions? No. Thank you very much for your time. So please, yes, please tell the um, whole department, your men and women, that we appreciate what they do I and um, I, I will thank you and it's it's something I let them know all the time because as you can imagine uh, it's a tough time to be a police officer <laughs> it's always a tough job but it's tough uh, you know I've got uh, I don't have 44 years now in this business myself and uh, something you put your heart and soul into your whole career it's tough to see uh, see it uh, denigrated by people and whatnot and 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 by your own people too, you know, that uh, are responsible sometimes for causing that. We're usually our own worst enemies. Uh, so uh, it's a tough, tough thing, but uh, there are a lot of supportive people in this community and they've continued to show their support throughout this. Uh, it's been very evident. So I thank, I thank all of you and I thank the community for that. Thank you very much. Thank you.
I want to thank everyone for the update tonight. And any other uh, comments, Mr. Stilwell? Okay. So next we'll have a public hearing. Madam Kirk, Clerk, could you please read the title? The City Council will consider a recommendation of the Planning Commission to approve a mitigated uh, negative declaration, general plan land use map amendment, and zone change at 1223 Fairway Drive. And the staff report is to be made by Community Development Director, Mr. Ng. Good evening, Madam Mayor Patino and members of the City Council. Uh, this is a request for general plan amendment and zone change for property located at 1223 Fairway Drive at the northwest corner of Skyway and Fairway. The applicant, Dan Blau, is requesting a land use change on the 1.3 acre site from light industrial to commercial and a corresponding zone change from PDM1, that's Plan Development Light Manufacturing, to PDC2, Plan Development General Commercial. The site is currently developed with a parking lot that serves the Frontier Communications Building to the west. The property is surrounded by light industrial uses and major employers for the area such as Saffron Cabin, Hardy Diagnostics, and Mindbody. Here are some photos from the ground of the property. Again, the request is to change the land use from light industrial to commercial. The commercial designation would accommodate for a wider range of uses that would serve this area. In particular, dining uses that would provide lunch options for those that work in this area. The proposed change to commercial would be compatible with the surrounding industrial and office uses. The Planning Commission recommended this for their approval in their May 5, 2020 meeting. Staff forwarding the Planning Commission's recommendation asks that the City Council adopt a resolution approving the mitigated negative declaration, adopt a resolution amending the general plan land use policy map designation of the 1.3 acres from light industrial to community commercial, and introduce an ordinance amending the zoning map for 1.3 acres from PDM1 to PDC2. This concludes staff's presentation. I'm available for any questions you may have. Any questions of Mr. Ng? No, I don't have any no. questions, just a comment. No questions from the council? Is the applicant here? Yes, Madam Mayor, he appears to be here. Mr. Blau, are you there? May have lost him. Mr. Blau? There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Oh. I had great difficulty getting the unmute button to work. Um, I don't really have anything to add. Um, staff made a very concise presentation. Uh, it's just a matter of this is an area that's way underserved for, um, for food options, especially during lunch. We think we'll do a lot to solve a bunch of traffic congestion and other, other issues. Just happy to go forward with it. I'm, I'm basically here tonight to give have any questions you might have. Any questions of Mr. Blau? Oh, Mr. Cordero. I don't have any questions. I just should report that uh, Mr. Blau and I have talked about this in the past. Uh, it was just a conceptual thing. There was no, no writing or anything. It was just kind of an idea six or eight months ago. Thank you. No comments or questions, Mr. Blau? Okay. Do we have any requests to speak or written correspondence? No, Madam Mayor, we do not. I'll bring this back to the council. Any discussion on a motion? Madam Mayor, if, if not, I'd like to go ahead and make a motion. And do I need to make a motion separately? Vote separately on each motion? You can make them I all can together. I can do all of them together. Okay. I'd like to uh, make a motion to adopt a resolution approving a mitigated negative declaration 
adopt a resolution amending the general plan land use policy map designated of the 1.3 acres from light industrial to community commercial and to introduce an ordinance amending the zoning map for 1.3 from PDM1 plan development light manufacturing to PDC2 plan development general commercial zoning district. I'll second it. There's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Madam Clerk, can you please call the roll? Councilmember Waterfield? Aye. Councilmember Motes? Aye. Councilmember Cordero? Aye. Councilmember Soto? Aye. And Madam Mayor Patino? Aye. Motion carries. Next, we have a regular business item. Madam Clerk, could you please read the title? The City Council will consider an ordinance regulating mobile billboards and advertising signs improperly affixed to vehicles. And the staff report is to be made by... City Attorney, not, Jeff Patrick, <laughs> not, Mr. City Attorney. not Mr. Watson, Mr. Patrick, thank you. Madam Mayor, uh, members of the City Council, item 6A is a proposed ordinance for regulating mobile billboards. It's sort of a technical amendment as we started looking into what kind of options we had into regulating mobile billboards. We determined that our current ordinance is too broad. Uh, when you're regulating what can be parked on the streets, it's designated by the California Vehicle Code and that trumps anything that we could do locally. So there's only certain things that we can do. Our current ordinance prevents all advertising vehicles from parking on the streets. Unfortunately, we can't do that. So this proposed ordinance goes to the full extent that we can. Um, it regulates mobile billboards. And that's not gonna be the type of advertising vehicles you see in LA that, or Las Vegas that drive around with the vehicles on it. This is going to be billboards that are on trailers that get parked. We can regulate those. The other thing that we can regulate is improperly affixed signage. So this would be a truck that parks on the side of the road and they have a sign put in the back of the truck or draped over the bed, something like that. Uh, it doesn't apply to items that are uh, permanently affixed to a vehicle. So that would be paintings, decals. Um, in the way that we interpret the code right now, that would also include those mobile billboards that you do see in Las Vegas because those are permanently affixed to those. We will continue monitoring that section to see if there's any case law, see if there's anything in the future where we can add regulations, but for now we don't think that we can. Uh, the remedy under this, if there are mobile uh, billboards or improperly affixed signage, is that we will give a warning and then within 24 hours we can tow. That's it for this item, if you have any questions. Any questions, Mr. Patrick? Ms. Soto? Yes. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Mr. Patrick, does this, is this just for, is this, sorry, I don't know. <laughs> um, is this only for commercial advertisements? This would be any, I, I'm struggling to think what would be a non-commercial advertisement. So I, I would think Campaign yes. slogans. With respect, with respect to political, <laughs> it, very important. This, this it does not deal with the content, so it, as it deals with the conduct, so we're not making a determination between commercial and political signage. Okay. This is whether or not it's an appropriate conduct and a vehicle as opposed to what the message is, to be clear. And a vehicle is also a bicycle. It could be. You could have could a signage be. affixed to a bicycle. You could, um, specifically with these trailers, you might be towing it in on a bicycle or uh, mm -hmm. you know, a truck behind it and you know, leaving it parked. But if it's permanently fixated, like then it's not? The permanently affixed is a little bit complicated because it would be paints, decals, or a spot that is put on there by the manufacturer. So that would be like the, a license plate section if you have dealer plates. Or um, let's see, you could have... Yeah, that would all be okay. Mm -hmm. and, it, and what we do is we would give a warning that they're parked unlawfully and then if they're still there within 24 hours we could tow. Or if they've received a warning uh, within a certain period of time then we can tow them again in the future. What about flags on the cars? F flags I don't believe would be signage but there might be another if it, there's content on the flags, then it could be considered advertisement. Yeah, at this point, we're not. We're, we're regulating what was 
previously on the books to clean it up as opposed to looking for new. Okay. Any other questions? Did you have a question, Dr. Mott? Oh, okay. No other questions from the council? Okay. Madam Clerk, do we have any requests to speak or written correspondence? No, Madam Mayor, we do not. Okay. So, Mr. Patrick, that is like a pickup with a sign sitting in the back saying, eat at Joe's or whatever, and parked in front of Joe's. Mm -hmm. Okay. That would be, yeah, that would be covered. Okay. Okay, I'll bring this back to the, um, this item back to council for discussion and a motion. Madam, if there's no discussion, I'd like to make a motion. Okay. Do I hear a second? Second. It's been a motion and a second. Any uh, further discussion? Hearing none. Madam Clerk, can you please call the roll? Council Member Waterfield. Aye. Council Member Motz. Aye. Council Member Cordero. Aye. Council Member Soto. Aye. And Madam Mayor Patino. Aye. Next, we have a regular business item. Madam Clerk, could you please read the title? The City Council will consider an ordinance regulating and allowing for the impoundment of unattended property left blocking streets, sidewalks, and public property. Staff report is to be made again by Mr. Patrick. Madam Mayor, members of the City Council, uh, item 6B is a proposed ordinance regulating unattended property left on city streets in the public right of way. Um, while the City's Attorney's Office was at the League of California Cities Conference last year, we were advised by, our, by the conference and also by our insurance risk pools that we should start looking into adopting regulations on dockless devices, rentable scooters. So far, that hasn't really come to Santa Maria, so it's a little bit too early, premature, to make a regulatory system for that. So what we've looked into and done instead is to prohibit leaving unattended, uh, unowned devices on city streets. They block pedestrian right-of-ways. They create Ameri uh, uh, Americans with Disabilities access issues. They create blight. Uh, so this proposed ordinance allows us to impound that, to sell it if necessary. We contact the owner if they don't pay a charge. Um, we sell it if the charges won't cover the fees for impounding and holding the auction, then we are allowed to destroy it. Um, in the future, if a company wanted to come to the city and have dockless devices, they still could. They could have um, kiosks that they do it from. They could open storefronts. Or they could approach the city and negotiate uh, encroachment permits on certain areas where we'd have pickups and drop-offs, which other cities have done. And Thank that you. is it, if you have any questions. Any questions from the council? Dr. Motes. Yes, as I was reading the staff report, it says in, on page two, please note that this ordinance applies to all property left unattended and uh, with no ascertainable owner within the public right-of-way and not merely to dockless devices. So when I first read this, it reminded me that when I'm out jogging in the morning between 5.30 and 6.30, I often encounter uh, shopping carts owned by homeless people filled with their life's possessions, but unattended. So I was just wondering how, how wide a net does this cast on other things besides dockless uh, scooters? It will apply to any property left within the right-of-way. It doesn't discriminate. Uh, we do already have ordinances and plans that deal with um, shopping carts. If a certain amount are left out within a certain time, the business has to create a plan, um, pay for it. I'm not entirely familiar with it, but that mm -hmm. we would likely go under what we already have in place for shopping carts. And the, the purpose of this is really to get ahead of the curve. Uh, in, a past, uh, in a past life, we had an organization um, just show up with 60 or 80 of these dockless elements, and no one had any kind of regulatory uh, element to it, which created a, a bit of consternation, whether it's, again, scooters, uh, bicycles, uh, any kind of rentable mobility items. Um, and this, this really is to give us a, a, a prospective tool. It's not for a current issue that we have. Uh, we have adequate uh, 
uh, regulatory schemes for those other elements, and we work carefully with our with our homeless uh, advocates uh, to try and avoid that element. We're not looking to use this in any broader fashion, but really as a prospective uh, prohibition in the event something pops up. And that is because there was a, a substantial amount of um, business activity in the dockless arena when this first was uh, was raised, and we're also trying to make sure we stay ahead of. Uh, of the legal issues. And I know going to meetings it, just in the county of Santa Barbara and when they're talking about it <clears throat> and it has it become an issue, you know, we talk at SBCAG and I go, no, it's not an issue up here, but it is an issue down South County. It's become an issue. And so they, they weren't ahead of it and they were trying to figure out how to resolve it. Any questions? Thank you. Madam Clerk, do we have any requests to speak or written correspondence? No, Madam Mayor, we do not. Okay. I'll bring this back to the Council for any further discussion and or a motion. If no further discussion, I'd like to introduce an ordinance for the first reading and continue to the next reading for second reading and adoption, regulating and allowing the impoundment of unattended property left blocking streets, sidewalks, and public property. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Madam Clerk, can you please call the roll? Councilmember Waterfield? Yes. Councilmember Motes? Aye. Councilmember Soto? Aye. Councilmember Cordero? Aye. And Madam Mayor Patino? Aye. Next, we have a regular business item. Madam Clerk, could you please read the title? The City Council will consider an ordinance regulating mobile car washing for commercial purposes within the city. And there you are again, Mr. Patrick. Are you sick of me? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Madam Mayor, members of the Council, item 6C is a proposed ordinance regulating mobile commercial washing. And unlike the last item, this is a current problem within the city. The purpose of this ordinance is to prevent dirty water filled with solvents, car grease, heavy metals, other pollutants from being discharged into our city's stormwater system. If the pollutant rates get too high, we can suffer substantial daily fines that will be charged against the city. It's our duty to make sure that we're complying uh, with these stormwater requirements. So mobile commercial washing within the city is very popular, but it's also currently unregulated. So staff has attempted before in the past to use uh, ordinances and other sections of the municipal code that we have that don't specifically apply to uh, mobile car washing, and it's not been effective and it's caused other problems. So it's something we've been looking into a while to uh, create a regulation system for mo mobile, mobile co commercial washing. Uh, so the biggest issue with these operators is that they're not mobile. They're setting up shops on city streets. They're washing cars in one place. They're hailing um, cars from the street. And what that does is it, uh, it, um, mo it maximizes the amount of pollutants that are getting dropped into one spot and then going into the storm drains, increasing our potential risk for getting fined. Uh, we also have certain operators that are putting down cones, blocking off parking, blocking off spaces, um, and it's not a very safe uh, situation. So one thing that this ordinance does is it bans mobile commercial washing from all city streets. What we are looking for is that the mobile commercial washers will not set up shop in one spot, but will go to the car on personal property um, of the, with the permission of the owner or tenant or on business property, commercial property, and they'll wash it off the street. That's safer. It opens up cars and, or open up, opens up parking for cars, which we are sorely in need of parking. <laughs> and it makes them be truly mobile. They're going from spot to spot. They're not setting up shop. They're not accumulating all this pollutant possibility in one spot. Uh, part of the ordinance creates a permitting scheme. There are two main types of permits. One would be a waterless wash, which I'll explain, and the other would be a more traditional wash with water. So a waterless wash, if you're not familiar with it, you take a, a, a solvent spray. It's Think of like a Windex bottle type thing. You spray it on a part of the car. It creates a scientific layer between the car paint and finish and the, so or in the dirt that's on the car. It lifts up the dirt. You take a microfiber towel and wipe it off. The dirt comes off with the towel because the microfibers has little like fiber fingers. <laughs> it picks up all the dirt, doesn't scratch the car. It's great for uh, mildly dirty cars, 
little slightly dirtier cars. It's not great for heavily soiled, but we don't want people washing heavily soiled cars in the street anyways. We want them to go to um, fixed car washes. So it's this great system, and we have it as one of our permit types, and we make it a lot easier to do that because it's cheaper. There's not water, so we don't risk uh, the water, the polluted water falling into the storm drains. It, it saves us a lot of hassle with enforcement if people are doing waterless washes. So we, uh, the regulatory system encourages people to move towards that type of washing. It's safer. We also have uh, permits for traditional washes, which would be soap and water. Um, those ones are a little more difficult to get because we want to make sure that the stormwater requirements are being met. So we have a series of minimum equipment that they would have to obtain and use. These would include a catch basin that you drive the car over that would catch all of the water going in. Um, you need a pump system that's capable of sucking out that water and then a tank capable of holding all the dirty water. Then you need equipment to safely transport that throughout the city because we don't want someone with a 500 gallon tank driving on unsafe equipment. And then once they uh, have the water in the tank, they need somewhere to dispose it. So they need to get a holding tank waste disposal permit from the city, and those are currently free, and they allow you to dispose of water in our wastewater treatment plant. And we will also accept permits from other wastewater treatment plants. Um, and the reason that we're doing this and requiring the water to be disposed at a disposal facility is so that we can track it. If we don't do that, then it's very easy for someone to just pour water into our stormwater drain at nighttime when we're not looking for it. And then we can never cite them, and then we can still run into all these problems that we're trying to, event, or to prevent by regulating it. Let's see. Um, so for traditional water permits, you are required to demonstrate that they can uh, meet the the requirements of the chapter. So they do that by doing a demonstration of washing a car in front of a code compliance officer. Um, so that will ensure that they have the right equipment, that they know what they're doing and that they can use it correctly. The benefit for us is that we're doing our enforcement in the beginning instead of when they're out on the city streets when they're harder to find. Let's see, other permits available are charitable event permits and they can be waterless or for traditional uh, washes with water. We would again encourage that the waterless permits be uh, pursued because all the other requirements of the chapter need to be met if they are deciding to wash with water. And then we also have sponsored permits, which would be where an employer can obtain the permit for their employees if they have multiple um, and then if an employee leaves, transfers, instead of losing the permit, he can transfer it to another employee. The ordinance includes bonding, insurance, and indemnification provisions that are there to protect the city. That's if we find someone you know, violating the ordinance, we can go after the bond or they have insurance depending on what it is they did that uh, damaged us. The permits can be revoked after three violations on any one year rolling on a rolling basis. And the reason that we have that is the violation uh, so that we can charge. So the infraction amounts are just not sufficient to discourage violations. Uh, we do not have fees set in place now. We're going to be working on those and the registration process. Uh, so we'll be coming back to you for resolution setting fees. And we will not enforce this until our presumed date is January 1. But if we don't have the registration and the fees and all that in place, then we'll kick it out from 90 days to whenever we do. I know this was a longer one. Are there any questions? Any okay, questions, Ms. Waterfield? What does this do for people that wash their own cars in their own homes, at their, at, in their yards or on their driveways? Great clarification. It's been my fault for not mentioning that. It does not apply to them. It's only for commercial washes for money. OK. And is there any? Is there any uh, car wash business that is grandfathered in the old way, or does everybody have to comply with this? Well, so for car washes, if they are a fixed business, this does not apply to them. It only applies to mobile oh. commercial washing. And there's no mobile commercial washing um, business that is going to be grandfathered in the old way. It's all going to be, everyone is going, going to do that. Yes, correct. Okay. And and really, we need everyone doing the same thing and following the requirements and truly being mobile and not 
uh, discharging into our stormwater drains. And so if, if you're working at uh, J.C. Penney's and you want your car wash and they just take a section of that uh, parking lot to wash their car, that is permittable? Yes. With the uh, property manager of J.C. Penney's, that whatever that area is, with their permission, they would be able to come onto that commercial property and wash cars. But or they would also have to have it, if it's, if it's, water, if it's not waterless, they will have to have the... Uh, component to gather the water and take it yes, away. Yes, they would need to have all the minimum required equipment. Do we, do we know how expensive that is for a business to uh, purchase those components to gather the water? Do we, do we know the expense? We have created estimates of what okay. the equipment value is. However, many, many of the folks that we deal with on a regular basis are already doing some burning, doing some of this. Okay because we've been trying to work with them for the, for the same reason. The, the purpose right. of this is to protect the city's stormwater, and so we have gone, we just didn't have the tools in one collective yeah. ordinance code to try and deal with it. But no, we don't have an estimate of the cost uh, of the equipment. Okay. Well, one reason we do want to require specific equipment is what's happening now is operators are taking dirt out from city tree wells putting it into the street, collecting the water, using that dirt. If we have staff there, maybe they collect it. If not, maybe they put it right back into that city tree yeah. well, and now it's polluting and potentially killing the trees. What is, it, what is the condition of our stormwater, our stormwater drains? Do we? Shad's not around. Is I can't he? answer that specifically, but I know about a year and a half ago, there was a lot of concern that we would um, be getting fined. I, th I think that we were maybe got a warning letter, I can't say for certain, but I know mm -hmm. that uh, we started talking about it heavily back then. Okay, thank you. Dr. Motes. Yeah, I'm concerned by how many small businesses this is gonna put out of business. I know that my wife and I use mobile car wash people. My wife thinks if you wanna have your car washed really well, there's only one way to do it, with the guy that washes our car with the mobile car wash. Mm -hmm. And I think he uses a public street. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think he uses a berm. Um, I don't know about the economics of mobile car washes, but my wife seems to think they operate on a very small profit margin. And if we start burdening them with a, obtaining permits, tanks, purchasing berms, it, it's going to make it more expensive for them to carry out their business, and they may just go under. That is a potential. I will tell you that the fines that we can be subject to are potentially $10,000 a day if we have these uh, storm water regulation violations. I'm so sorry. it's a very important issue for have this. Have we city. actually been threatened by those fines? Someone has submitted a complaint to the EPA recently. Hmm. Uh, Dr. Motes, I have um, Mr. Springer on the phone. He could probably answer that. Yes, good evening, Madam Mayor. And good evening. Um, I understand that um, Councilmember Waterfield had a question regarding the status of the basins. Yes. And, and I'm not sure if, if you could articulate maybe what that question is. Uh, oh my gosh. Okay. okay. <laughs> In regards to what is the status of our stormwater basins with the uh, pollutants of the uh, car washes, you, washing cars on streets, does that make a significant um, change if we have it one way or the other? Yeah, and it's the stormwater quality relative to the runoff and our regulatory requirements. It's a, a complicated issue to unpack, um, but the gist of it is is that um, the regional board recognizes or recognizes several of the uh, what I'll call ditches uh, throughout uh, the city as waters of the state. Um, that means that if the discharge runs, uh, for example, on the street and into a drainage inlet and then into um, Battles Ditch, for example, the Blosser Ditch, um, those are considered waters of the state, and that is where we are supposed to meet our discharge requirement. 
So uh, they could consider it a violation coming out of our storm drain system into those ditches because they are considered um, waters of the state. So that is really where those pollutants of concern uh, are an issue for us. Uh, we have a program where we have to do um, illicit discharge, um, identification and elimination. It is part of the city's stormwater permit. And I can tell you that when regional board staff were out to audit us uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, as they were traveling with city staff, when they saw it was a dry day, but they saw water in the curb line, they followed it all the way to its source to determine where that discharge came from. And they were asking city staff why we hadn't uh, taken action to eliminate that illicit and illegal discharge into the storm drain. Well, were we given any uh, violations and did we have to pay any fines? Um, not at that time. They produced a lot of questions. We provided responses and we are waiting on their um, evaluation of that. They, they haven't responded within a year and a half? <laughs> Correct. <laughs> well, it's really important to them, I guess. <laughs> Water Dr. Moats. Very slow. Yeah, Mr. Springer, I'd like to just ask a question based on something that Ms. Waterfield said. Uh, if we're requiring uh, commercial car washers to collect all of the wastewater and take it off site, um, how can we let people wash their own cars in the driveway where it goes right down the driveway into the same drain? I think probably the simplest answer to that is that is the way that the regional board wrote the regulations. Mm -hmm. um, they do have exemptions in there for um, people washing uh, essentially vehicles in their own yard. as long, And then of course we have them as well with our water conservation as long as they have a uh, automatic shutoff uh, on the hose. Um, so there is a very narrow exemption for individual owners. Uh, when they look at businesses, they consider it a commercial operation and they're concerned that it's the amount or quantity uh, of runoff, right? There's not that many uh, people washing their cars in their driveway and having the runoff as opposed to a business that operates. I can tell you uh, that for a brick and mortar car wash um, that you see throughout town, we have significant um, water requirements for that. In fact, those do not discharge to the stormwater system. They discharge to the sanitary sewer system, uh, but they have significant uh, pretreatment required requirements with sand oil separators. And then automatic car washes have expensive operating systems that um, rejuvenate the water for reuse. Don't forget, these, these mobile car washes are also competing with the brick and mortar. It's sort of like when we had the flowers, people bring in the flowers on the corner of the street versus the brick and mortar flower shops that, that were competing with that. I, I, I look at it the same way. Did you have a I, comment, I have, Ms. Ms. Soto? Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, you know, I, I want to thank Councilwoman Waterfield and Dr. Motes. You all asked literally the questions that I had <laughs> written down, so thank you for your thoroughness there. Um, I get my, my question here is, I mean, and it's more a hypothetical, and I don't know if, I, I don't expect staff to answer it, but um, I'm really concerned as to how this is going to impact our our, our smallest of the smallest business owners who um, right now may not have the ability to fork up, if, if, I mean, that's the best way I can come up with, fork up an additional cost, um, especially during these times of COVID, where we're seeing so many people really struggling to make ends meet, and, and every dollar right now counts. And so, um, you know, I, I, I would like to, I'm, I'm interested in learning more about this, especially the environmental impacts that this would have. Um, but I don't believe that right now would be the right time for us to put this additional burden on the small business owners. And I hear the concern of, um, you know, taking business away from the brick and mortar, but I mean, really you can't compare the amount of business that, this, you know, some of the largest car wash stations that we have in Santa Maria with, with, a, with a one person operating a teeny, teeny business budget. I mean, I, I don't believe that it's really taking that much business. I, it, it's almost like when I hear people say, those mobile taco trailers are taking business from my brick and mortar. I, I mean, it, I, I, I don't believe I, that's a really 
that I don't believe that. So, um, yeah, I'm just really worried about how this is going to affect our, our smallest of the smallest business owners, um, especially during this time of COVID when we're asking them to, to take on additional costs. Madam Mayor, if I may respond, yes. because, um, again, overseeing the Code Enforcement Division, um, we regularly see multiple, multiple um, car washes all lined up on one block or two blocks. Um, one, it, one comment I would have with respect to the impact of costs of equipment, that is why we are encouraging and giving uh, a, a priority to the waterless car wash element, which is a product that can be purchased to, in essence, do the same job without the cost of equipment and the maximizing of the water impacts. Uh, we regularly see on certain streets 10 or 12 of these lined up on any given day, all draining into the same storm drain. And so there is, there is a lot of um, individuals doing this, and it may not be a large volume, but from a city perspective, there is a large number of these um, I can't call them violators because it's not a violation currently, but, but problem um, uh, providers of effluent into the, the, the water system. So for, to, to answer Ms. Soto's question, I do believe that there are workarounds that we've included in here that eliminates both problems. It eliminates the high cost of uh, equipment impact to a small business, but it also eliminates the risk to the city of the water issue and does not then prevent those small business people from simply modifying their business practice, which is what regulatory schemes do, is to modify business practices for the benefit of the community. And that's what, what the ask is. And I do believe that the waterless products are available at local car stores um, and can be rapidly modified into a business uh, model. How many do you think we have, Mr. Watson? I guess. Local car washers? I, I could say dozens. Quite a lot. We receive a lot of complaints in code enforcement. Yeah. Okay. I, 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 don't, I didn't dozens or a lot. I, I would say, I would say uh, an, an over-under would be uh, over 20 and under 50. Oh, okay. It gives me an idea. Madam Mayor. Well, before you go take your run in the morning, you can wash your wife's car. <laughs> I've got that solved for you. <clears throat> okay, Dr. Motes. I wonder, do we have any uh, people who own such businesses uh, online to testify for I was, us? I was going to ask. Oh, she is saying no. You know, I'd really like to have some of those businesses actually uh, stand right there behind that uh, podium and, and tell us what they do for their business and how they could modify it and whether or not going to uh, waterless would be a viable alternative for them. Before we just um, eliminate their business, you know, I mean, I have they been no, notified? How do we notify them? Um, you know, they're going to find tomorrow morning that uh, when the paper comes out that we passed a rule that as of next January 1st, they're going to have to find someone else to do their business is gone. Ms. Waterfield. I wonder if we could write this legislation to where we would address those that are standstill only that you see lined up and, until, just to let them know we mean business, just, just so that it'll give these other businesses time to come in and say, you know, I, I do want to hear from them as well. Um, well, if they're all lined up someplace, we you know we could put we could postpone this, and if they're all lined up someplace, we can drop off flyers. You know, I mean that's that, that would, real that simple. Would, that would be fine. But um, if you know if we could draft <clears throat> legislation uh, currently, you know, if do we want to vote on it this partially, or do we want to just hold off? Um, I, I am concerned with the ones that stay in one location all the time. I, those, I, I totally agree with, with city staff. They shouldn't be there. They're mobile units. They, you know, you get a call, you go here, you go there, and other places like that. Um, and I'm concerned with our storm water because we do have to uh, clean that <clears throat> up. And, it, and those chemicals cost quite a bit to the city as well. So. 
you know, I, I think the stormwater is important. I, is in any business that you have, and we were in business for so many years, and you have to, you go by uh, regulations. Every year there's new regulations. You have to update your equipment, and that's part of doing business. And when you do that, and it adds more cost, then of course, whoever buys your, uh, your product gets charged more also. So um, let's not forget the, the standards that we have to go by through our stormwater. <clears throat> I have no idea what this costs. If you, if you would like to postpone this and give them notice, because we have no one here, so. And, and I, I, I would like to do that. Only, yeah, because this is just a shock. Me too. Th this is a, quite a bit of a shock to them. Um, Mr. Cordero. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, <clears throat> In, in listening to whether or not they should be stationary or not stationary, if there's some, I, I don't know what difference it's going to make if they're washing the car and we're concerned about the deposit going into the storm runoff, whether they're washing it on Morrison Street or on Donovan, doesn't really make any difference. They're, they're, they're washing the car. So, so perhaps... Having them all in the same area might be to our own advantage uh, to, to some degree. And, and I, I don't know how they measure, how, the, how they would even measure that. And we, as individual residents, are in fact contributing to the same thing. So, so it's going to be difficult to measure and say, well, it's, it's the fault of the mobile washer. Um, so it, it, this, this is going to be a, a small nightmare for some of these people and extremely devastating to, to the smallest of small business people. So I, 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 too, would be in favor of postponing this until we get a little bit more information and understanding of how we're going to be measuring these this uh, these chemical this chemical debris that's going into our storm runoff, uh, because we ourselves are contributing to it. If you happen to wash your own car, so it's going to be difficult to measure at best. Okay, and currently we are unregulated, <clears throat> so it sounds like it, do we want to be regulated at all? Um, well, I think we have to. Okay, so we're going from unregulated to regulated and what that is going to mean in between. <clears throat> so, um, I, I, I don't need a motion for that. We just... Um, what, what we'll do is uh, I'll have my, my code division... <laughs> they they code see them regularly. <laughs> we will yeah. advise them and we will bring it back on a date certain where we will provide them I would like we'll to, to I'd like to see what other cities do and I'd like to hear from Mr. Springer on it also yeah, yeah. Sorry. yeah um, just more detailed information as to how exactly these mobile car washes are polluting um, our storm water and I mean that's something that I'm really interested in learning more about um, but with more specifics at a later time Thank you. Thank you for the great report, though. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay. Um, the next item will be a report by City Manager, Mr. Stilwell. Thank you, Madam Mayor and members of the Council. The next meeting of the City Council is June 16th. The main item there is budget adoption. So, again, we'll provide you, uh, the four of you who requested hard copy binders, we'll get those to you tomorrow. And the others, uh, we did send you the link that where the budget is online, so you'll be able to access it now, and the public will be able to access it to, at tonight as well. As you're reviewing the budget, I'd encourage you to primarily focus on the 29 pages that are in Section A, the budget message. You'll see, as <coughs> you wouldn't be surprised, with the federal budget and the state budget being strained, many of the city budgets being strained, that we have strains throughout our budget as well. I mean, the good news is we have uh, reserves and we have um, money to be able to borrow to maintain services. And we also have a strong consumer-based economy that 
um, is it less tourist dependent than some of our neighboring cities. So in that sense, we're better off. On the other side, we are real focused on sales tax, and that's been down with, uh, with the economic closure. So we do have impacts throughout the city and each department, and so it's important for you to understand those as we're going into the budget on uh, June 16th. And that's the main item, and there's a couple other consent items. And one would be a grand jury response on cybersecurity. They issued a report on cybersecurity for all the cities and will provide a response for the council to consider at the, on June 16th as well. That concludes my report. Madam Mayor, I have a comment for our city manager. Yes. Um, we have received many letters in regards to the, the Paul Nelson swimming pool, and we're going to receive a lot more in the future. So if you could take a look when we're doing the budget of what we might be able to do to see how we can open up that swimming pool. Okay, let's get do um, oral reports of council members. Mr. Cordero, we'll start with you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, on the 20th, I did the Ben Hay Show. On the 21st, I attended a Zoom meeting uh, for the United Way uh, Board. And then yesterday I was at the uh, the news release where you issued the uh, curfew. There's been some other Zoom meetings that I've had, but that will be all I report on. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Ms. Soto? Madam Mayor, I don't believe I have any reportable items, but um, I was wondering, I know that in the past we've closed our meetings um, in, in memory of uh, a life lost and so I would like to propose um, if it's okay with the council to end the meeting um, in in remembering George Floyd and sending our condolences to his family and just taking a strong stance um, you know um, against the the intolerance that 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 exists um, in our country and really standing with our African Americans brothers and sisters during this time thank you Ms. Waterfield yes um on Wednesday, May 20th, I had a, uh, a meeting with a constituent in regards to some housing in the city of Santa Maria. Friday, May 22nd, I did attend the funeral of our former council member, Willie Green. That was, that was a very wonderful uh, funeral. Um, Monday, May 25th, I attended the Memorial Day celebrations at the Santa Maria Cemetery. Um, attended the uh, Monday yesterday the announcement and today I had a CCWA uh, pers personnel committee meeting closed session. Dr. Motz. Well, on May 20th, I listened telephonically to the school board meeting where I was mandatorily muted. <laughs> so, my focus there was not recorded. <laughs> Thank you. Is there a reason that I, I, I'm on some of those meetings where they do ma mute me too, and I, I don't feel in the least bad about it. May 20th, I uh, attended the quarterly schools meeting, Zoom meeting. Um, did the county stakeholder team leaders follow up meeting on the teleconference? Did the Santa Maria key leaders check in teleconference? May 21st, did the SBCAG board meeting, and we do that live at the Board of Supervisors here. In the afternoon, uh, did the APCD board meeting of directors. And this is easy when you've got these meetings that are smashed together, and you, you're one place, but you can do the other one on your phone. So I intended the, the key, leady, key leaders unifying recovery efforts teleconference. Then did the legislative briefing on COVID teleconference. On the 22nd, I did the Rick Blameyer show in the morning. And we've been doing a lot of informational stuff that's been going on with COVID-19. Um, I had a meeting with Assemblyman Cunningham briefing and went to the funeral of Willie Green, who was one of our council members. On May 23rd, um, placed flags at the cemetery for Memorial Day. May 25th, the city of Santa Maria, I took a, a wreath for a Memorial Day celebration at the Santa Maria Cemetery, which was very well attended. On the 27th, attended the Marion Foundation Board of Directors meeting teleconference. Did a Santa Maria key leaders check in on a teleconference. On the 28th, I did the um, California Community Prosperity Summit. Um, 
teleconference, did the weekly key meters, unifying recovery efforts teleconference, and the legislative briefing call, which we do once a week with the County of Santa Barbara and Public Health to update us on what's going on. On the 29th, I did the Santa Barbara uh, County Mayor's and City Manager's Zoom meeting and did the Santa Barbara County Public Health Press Conference. On the 1st of June, I did the REACH Weekly Leaders Call, and in the afternoon yesterday, we did the press conference here at City Hall. And this morning, did Ben Hayes' show. Um, I was just wondering if any of you have had comments on the curfew that we instilled. Um, I have. Positive uh, or negative? They, the, the ones I got were positive okay. about, thank you, and even uh, and encouraging the chief to go out and arrest everybody that is on the street, <laughs> uh, which we all know is not practical, but... But yeah, I've had uh, positive comments from the city. How about you, Ms. Soto? Um, I, I've heard more questions than comments like, um, what does this mean if I work late at night? And how would I share that with their police officers? And so more like those kind of questions, but really no um, comment on for or yeah. against. Ms. Waterfield? None. None. Dr. Motes? That's rude. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I know I have received both um, for and against that we're really crazy to do this. And, and some questions like, you know, why and stuff. But I, and I explain to people that our policemen are very well trained, very professional. They know um, who the bad actors are in town and if they feel a need. At least it's a tool they have in case... They think there's something happening to, you know, to prevent that. And that's where we're, it's, it's part of education, as uh, Chief Hansen said, educating the people and preventing anything that um, could be destructive. But I've, I've had both, so. Um, anyway, okay, well, that is any other thing tonight? Thank you very much. Meeting is adjourned.